So if you have a copy of Scripture with you this morning, I'm going to encourage you to open back up with us to the Old Testament book of Jonah. If you want to use that pew Bible in the rack in front of you, you can turn to page 775, and that should get you to Jonah chapter 3 today. If you were with us last Sunday, we left Jonah in what's probably the most famous moment in the book that bears his name. The prophet was sinking down to a watery grave. Seaweed was wrapped around his head. The ocean water was crushing him physically. And at the very last moment when it seemed like all things had been lost, the Lord appointed a massive fish to swallow Jonah whole. As we said last week, when you're in the midst of drowning, being swallowed by a massive fish is probably not your best idea, your version of how salvation should come. And that was a reminder that for many of us, God's grace and mercy can seem almost unrecognizable when we're in the midst of it. His kindness comes in very strange ways. Even hardship and affliction, He uses to draw us closer to Himself. And so Jonah realizes at some point that him being swallowed up by this massive fish and being sustained by the Lord is salvation, is grace and mercy, and finally calls out to God with a prayer of thanksgiving and praise in the belly of the beast, ending with that incredible truth in chapter 2, verse 9, that salvation belongs to the Lord. That's what we pick up in the story today in Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 10 and then going into chapter 3. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them. And he did not do it. Brothers and sisters, this is the Word of God. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, merciful Father, righteous Son, Holy Spirit, as we again step into a familiar story today. Father, we run headlong into the most miraculous event in this book. We run headlong into the glorious truth that salvation belongs to You. And as we've already sang this morning, You are the God who takes hearts of stone and replaces them with hearts of flesh. You are the God who brings life out of what was dead. You are the God who can cause dry bones to be resurrected and brought to life. 
Father, we need that this morning. In all sorts of ways. We need your Holy Spirit to give us fresh eyes. To soften hearts that may be calloused or hard or indifferent. We need ears that are ready to truly hear and receive the word that you would speak to us. That as the word of the Lord came to Jonah, so through your word, inspired by your spirit, we would hear your voice clearly. Be obedient to what you call us to. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, many people would consider the most miraculous, earth-shattering, incredible moment of the book of Jonah to be the events that we saw last Sunday. Again, that moment where the prophet is sinking down to a watery grave and the Lord appoints a a massive fish to, to swallow him whole and only by his divine will sustains Jonah, keeps him alive in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, only to vomit him up alive later on. And make no mistake, it's a miracle. It is a divine act of God beyond human explanation and replication. Yet make no mistake, the greatest, most incredible, most earth-shattering miracle of the story is the one we just We don't know how much time passed between chapter 2, verse 10, when the fish vomits Jonah up onto the dry land, and chapter 3, verse 1. But what we're seeing in this moment is this, this poignant reset of the entire story of Jonah. We read that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time with almost the exact same words, the exact same calling that we heard back in chapter 1. The Lord spoke to Jonah and said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I have. Same calling. The same city. The same people. And yet something inside Jonah in this moment has changed. God has humbled His prophet to affliction, to hardship, drawing Him closer to Himself through His dramatic deep sea rescue. Before, when Jonah heard the word of the Lord, he headed as far as he could, almost 2,000 miles where he wanted to go, in the opposite direction, trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. But now, we read, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And yet it it might be worth us stopping to consider the fact that the first time Jonah ran and tried to go to Tarshish away from the presence of God, away from Nineveh, it was probably because of a combination of fear, of, of being afraid what would happen to him if he went and proclaimed the message of God in that capital city, of the Assyrian Empire, and probably also some contempt and hatred for the Ninevites themselves. In fact, when we get to chapter 4, it's kind of what's going to rise to the surface. He didn't want to proclaim the message of God to them because he didn't want them to have an opportunity to repent. He wanted to see the judgment of God to come down upon their heads. So it was a combination of cowardice and contempt towards them as a whole. And yet here is Jonah on his way to Nineveh. How much of Jonah's desires do you think have honestly changed? Do you think that the prophet now has his heart strangely warm so that he is glowing with affection towards these pagan Ninevites and he is willing to face whatever hardship, whatever suffering may come so that he can boldly and lovingly proclaim the message of God to them? Do you feel like Jonah's desires have shifted so that he is now eagerly desirous and wanting to go to the capital city 
of his country's greatest enemy and proclaim the message of God. Because he wants to go now. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, probably not. And yet, Jonah goes. And this moment serves as a reminder for us that in our life with God, following Christ and trusting the Lord will often lead us to obey God in spite of our desires, in spite of our feelings, in spite of our emotions. In fact, obeying God and following Christ will often lead us headlong into situations and circumstances we would much rather avoid altogether. And yet we go according to the word of the Lord. That when God speaks with clarity in His word, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, in the example of Christ, we go according to His word. And as we do so by His grace and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we draw closer to the God who calls us. It's it's not dissimilar from a moment that we read in Luke chapter 5 when Jesus and Peter are fishing together. Peter's gone fishing all night. He's caught nothing. He's, he's sweaty. He's tired. He's exhausted. And he comes back and Jesus says, hey, let's push out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter responds and said, Lord, we have been fishing all night and we have caught nothing. In other words, there's nothing inside Peter that wants to do this. He thinks it's fruitless. He thinks it's not going to amount to anything because they've caught nothing all night. Nothing inside of him thinks it's a good idea. And yet Peter ends that sentence by saying, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Because you say so, I will obey. So in our life with God, our following with Christ, in some of the same situations that we see Jonah in, we will be called to go and to follow the Lord, to be obedient to Christ, to trust God in spite of what our feelings and desires and emotions may tell us. And so Jonah heads to to Nineveh. Scripture tells us it's an exceedingly great city, about three days' journey in breadth. It's a massive area that Jonah's supposed to cover, maybe close to 55 miles or so. And yet, Scripture tells us that Jonah only walks in about one day's journey, so maybe about 20 miles in, and proclaims this very simple message. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now in all likelihood, that's actually a summary of the main thrust of the message that Jonah proclaimed, because throughout the story we learn that the Ninevites were at some point made aware about the sovereign God who could overthrow and destroy their massive city, and His displeasure in their wickedness and violence and the sin that they were committed, but the fact that we have a brief summary kind of drives home the point that the message Jonah proclaimed, or what God proclaimed through his prophet, was short, simple, and to the point. And then we arrive at the most incredible, earth-shattering, miraculous moment in the story of Jonah. Verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. The people of Nineveh believed God. Now remember, this is the capital city of, at that time, one of the greatest empires the world had known. And a city that's known historically for tremendous violence atrocities, horrendous acts of evil and wickedness that if we listed them all out, our kids might have nightmares tonight. Not only that, but it was a pagan city that worshipped all kinds of gods and idols, both things in creation, things made by man, and it was a melting pot of all kinds of different cultures and beliefs. So, in other words, if there was a god or an idol or a divine or any kind of spirit out there to worship, you could probably catch wind of it at some point in Nineveh. There was all kinds of omens and prophecies and oracles that were coming in and out of the city about all kinds of things around the world. In other words, if they could hear it, if it could be heard, you probably caught wind of it in this city. 
And yet here comes this random, singular, strange Hebrew prophet, maybe still oddly smelling of fish sticks at this point, declaring an ominous message about their fortified, massive city from a God that they've maybe even just barely heard of in amidst all the other ones that are out there. And they believed it. Scripture says they believed God. So much so that they, they, they call a citywide fast. The people themselves put on sackcloth and, and, they, and they don't eat or drink as a sign of their mourning and their grief and their hearts of repentance. And then all of a sudden, the word reaches the king and, and he humbles himself. He gets down from his throne. He puts on sackcloth. He sits in ashes. Either he's heard what's going on already, or he's the one who's endorsing it from the beginning, but he calls the entire city of Nineveh to fast and sit in sackcloth. And not just the people. Did you notice that? He says this applies to everything. Man and beast. Listen to verse 8. He says, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them be fed, not fed, or, or feed, or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. So, humanity and the animals are not drinking, and even the cows are covered in sackcloth. I mean, Peter would be having a field day at this moment. This is nationwide, man and beast, all repenting in sackcloth and ashes, turning towards the gods they've just heard about. But the king goes a step further. And that he really reveals the heart of what true repentance is. He says, everyone is to call out mightily to God. Turn towards God with all of their strength and to put away their evil the violence, the wickedness in their hands. Not just generally, but each and every one of you, he says. Whatever you're doing that is against Jonah's God, stop, cease, and cry out to him. There's a pagan Assyrian king telling the entire city to, to turn towards God in repentance, cry out for mercy, throwing themselves on his grace and forgiveness. I mean, just to put this in, in perspective a little bit, Imagine like leaving today, getting on a plane to JFK, catching a taxi in New York, driving to Times Square in Manhattan, standing on a street corner, preaching one sermon to maybe a small group of people, and the entire city of New York stops what they're doing, humbles themselves before God, and seeks the Lord. Including the mayor coming down out of the office. I mean, guys, this is the miracle in Jonah. The fish has got nothing on this moment. It's a moment that reveals to us both the miracle of salvation and the nature of genuine repentance. Again, this moment here is, is the greatest, most incredible, earth-shattering event that takes place here. But really what it is, is a, is a vivid illustration of the end of Jonah's prayer in chapter 2, verse 9. That salvation belongs to the Lord. Only God can do this. Only God can pull this off, to have an entire city turn towards Him. But that's not just true in the case of an entire city. That's true in salvation, period. Whether it's an entire city that turns to God, or one sinner who repents. Paul says in, Philipp in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1-10, through 10, that He is the one who brings life out of what was dead. We sang it earlier this morning, but Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, God says, I'm the one who takes out hearts of stone and replaces it with hearts of flesh. Salvation, turning towards God with honest hearts of repentance, is always the work of God, not of man whether it's an entire city or one sinner that turns to the Lord. And Jesus would have us know in Luke chapter 15 that all of heaven rejoices with just that one sinner. See, in this moment, the miracle of salvation. 
that is from the Lord and not from us. But we also see in this moment the, the genuine nature of, of repentance. There's something for us here in this moment to model. Because notice that, that after the Ninevites believe, as Scripture says they do in verse 5, their belief in the message that God proclaimed through Jonah led them to, to humble themselves before the Lord, to acknowledge and confess their sin. That's the, the sackcloth, that's the ashes, that's the fasting that caused them to turn towards God, to call out mightily to Him, and to turn away from their wickedness. Put away the evil that was in their hands. It wasn't just about the sackcloth and the ashes and even the fasting, because let's be honest, do we really believe that if the Ninevites had prayed and put on sackcloth and fasted and sat in ashes, but didn't turn away from the evil in their hands, that the Lord would have been pleased? No. Now you see a full image of repentance, but what that looks like is this, humbling ourselves before the Lord, honest acknowledgement and confession of our sins, turning towards God, and turning away from sin. And that is a model that applies to all believers throughout the course of our entire life. Repentance is not just something that we do once when we come to faith in Christ. But it's to be a part of our posture and rhythm of life as believers. It was Martin Luther that famously said, all of life is to be repentance. We never outgrow humbling ourselves before God, honestly confessing our sins, turning towards the Lord, and turning away from wickedness. We are never done, the author of Hebrews says, from throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and running with endurance the race that is set before us. This is what it means for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God, by His Spirit, working within us to will and to work for His good pleasure. But even now, as those who are in Christ, we need to understand that repentance is a part of that ongoing process of sanctification, of us being shaped more and more into the image of God. Christ. Listen to the words and the way that John the Apostle describes it to early believers in 1 John chapter 1 and 2. In verse 8 he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Verse 3, And by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. You see within these words from the apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit, that model of, of Christian repentance, of again, acknowledging the reality of our sin and our brokenness, turning towards Christ for assurance of our justification and forgiveness by the cross and the resurrection, but also an act of turning away from sin, a repentance away from sin, towards God. And this is something we're constantly engaged in. And he challenges these early believers, saying, listen, if you look at your life and you don't see any of what I'm describing, if you look at your life and you don't see this turning towards God, this humble confession, this seeking forgiveness, and this turning away from sin, over the course of your life, you have no reason to have confidence that you know Him. So this model of confession and repentance and turning towards God and away from our sin is what it means for us to continue in that path of following Christ. Continuing by His Spirit to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so even now, with the Ninevites, it's something for us to reflect on. Something for us to apply. As they repented before the Lord at the message that God spoke through Jonah. And in verse 10, we see how the Lord responds. In verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, I think that's interesting how it doesn't say how they put on sackcloth and fasted and 
and threw ashes on their head. That could be implied here, but really the, the onus is turn from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them. And he did not do it. This moment is a window into the heart of God who relents. A God who's eager to show grace and mercy towards those who seek Him. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 and 8, the Lord spoke to the prophet there and said, If at any time I declare concerning a kingdom or a nation that I will pluck up and, and break down and destroy it, And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. Again, this is the heart of God. And it's seen in the very message that Jonah was called to declare. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. But that 40 days was meant to draw out their repentance and turning towards the Lord. If God simply desired to, to destroy Nineveh right then and there, He could have done so, and justifiably so. And yet the message from the prophet was meant to draw out the repentance that He would bring in their hearts by His Spirit. Again, this is the window into the heart of a God who declares Himself to be, in Exodus 34, verse 6, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. If you go back and read through the prophecies of Jeremiah or the word of the Lord through the prophet, one of the reoccurring phrases that you hear God say to His people is, you have provoked me to anger. You've provoked me to judgment. You've provoked me to wrath. And you see that throughout the Bible. But it's interesting to note that God has to be provoked to anger to wrath, to judgment. He doesn't have to be provoked to love, to grace, and to mercy. It's spring-loaded and pent up within His nature. And that's not just us putting a flower coat on this. This is what God says about Himself. Listen again. Slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Not slow to love and abounding in steadfast anger. That anger is there. And it's righteous. And it's just. And He brings it. But He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love eager to show grace and mercy towards those who seek Him. Nowhere is that seen more clearly than in Christ. There's a stunning contrast because Jonah is sent to a wicked, rebellious, pagan people. And he calls them to repent and is probably surprised and a little bit annoyed when they do. When they believe God and turn towards the Lord. And yet Jesus was sent to a people who believed themselves to be righteous, believed themselves to be God-fearing, believed themselves to be with the Lord's will. His hearts were hardened and calloused to people that he knew wouldn't believe. In fact, this is the very contrast Jesus himself made. In Matthew chapter 12, we looked at the first part of this passage last Sunday. The Pharisees are asking for a sign, and Jesus says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And yet behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Christ went to a people knowing that they would reject Him, and yet He went anyway. He went to bear the full weight of our stubborn and rebellious and wicked hearts upon the cross to absorb the unrelented and unrestrained wrath of God in our place so that the miracle of salvation could be poured out on all those who by God's grace believe and follow Jesus. This is the message much greater than the message that Jonah preached to the Ninevites. The message of the Gospel. And yet Christ rebuked those who believed they were in the right. that They were fine. They were good because they refused to surrender and believe this good news. 
God forbid we be a part of that group. That in our own stubborn hearts refuse to accept and believe and embrace the truth of the gospel. And that would we, by God's grace and for His glory, model that which the Ninevites even put on display for us. Humble hearts that turn towards God and away from sin to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray together.